I'd like to ask an interest in your prayers this morning. <clears throat> Regardless of how many times you hear that song, you can't help but get a little emotional. But one of the things that has kind of been on my mind, and I will say that that um, my mind has gone in a couple of different directions this week, and so I'd ask for your for your prayers. I remember as a child growing up in in southwestern Oklahoma, having horses and then being around horses, and how they are such a they are a beautiful animal, but they're also a very strong animal. They're also a very strong willed animal. I will say also that there's another part of that equine group that's probably even a little more so stubborn, and that would be the mule. But reins, one of the things I wanted to talk about or pass on this morning for a few minutes is just our reins and reins that we have. There, there's a reason why ranchers who have horses, why those who ride horses, why they use reins. They use those reins to control that horse. Anybody who's been around horses, they know whenever you put that, that bridle on there, that bridle's also got a bit. And if you've never put a bit inside of a horse's mouth, that's the, that's the one in experience. And then two, once you begin to ride that horse and learn that horse, you can control that horse and how and what you do with that horse that you're riding. I remember also riding on that horse. We had, we had a couple. Jumping on that horse bareback, that doesn't always work so well. So when you go to grab onto that mane of that horse and he decides to take off running, there's not much that you can do except for just hang on. One of the things that, uh, that I recall also was we had, we had a couple of these two horses. One of them was, uh, was actually barrel racing champion of Texas, late 60s, early 70s. Anybody knows anything about barrel racing, you know those horses have very quick speed and very fast from the start. We had several friends that wanted to come over and ride these horses that we had. Well, this one particular horse, very spirited. So, my dad takes the saddle, throws the saddle on the horse, puts the bridle a bit, reins, throws it on the horse, and tells him, don't run this horse, because you will not be able to control this horse. Well, lo and behold, guess what happened? Yes, he did exactly what he was told not to do. He kicked her right square in the flanks, and off she took. And he lost control of that horse. And the only thing he could do is grab onto that horn of that saddle and scream for help. So those are some of the memories that come to my mind. But for us humans, you know, the rain that goes on that horse or that bridle or that bit is there for a purpose for those horses. Again, it's to control that horse. When we put that... Uh, that rain or bit on that wild horse, especially one that's not been broke, get ready because that, that horse is about ready to take off. And if you don't control it, you will be bucked off of that horse. In Jeremiah chapter 17, and I'll start off with verse 9. The heart is, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Verse 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins. And I understand that, that in this particular verse, he's meaning that in a different context. But I think we could use that in multiple 
context. So the Lord searches our heart. The Lord knows every part. He knows every portion. He knows every corner. He knows our intent. He knows our design. He knows our motive. And everything that is in our heart that is secret and that is wicked. Even though the heart is deceitful, it cannot deceive the Lord. The Lord knows. He knows exactly what is in our heart. But moving on, in Psalms chapter 32, verse 9, kind of brings me to my point. Be ye not as the horse, or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. This verse tells us how we are to behave under instruction. We should have rational thoughts. It should not act as though we are unteachable. It should not be stubborn to the point especially that we can't be taught. We should not, <clears throat> not hate instruction, but we should listen and listen to the Lord and those and our brethren. <clears throat> These horses that I speak about, and as mentioned here in Psalms, not only will they kick you or buck you off, but once you're bucked off, they'll kick you when you're down. And that's something that, that I think that um, when we start talking about control, and controlling this horse. I think it has two meanings here. It's also meaning about us as a child of God and how we are to control what we say, what we think, what we do, and how we do things. James chapter 3 and verse 3 also tells us, Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us. And we turn about their whole body. So in that this bit, it is a very small device. It is metal. person's never seen one. They typically come in two pieces for movement. And when you put that bit in that horse's mouth, it, there's a little bit of discomfort for that horse. But there's a reason for it. That small piece of metal controls a 2,000-pound animal. That bit that I'm speaking of is also right here in front of us. God's Word and how we control and should control our thoughts, what comes out of our minds, and then what we do. It is... Um, the tongue can be used to build a person up. A tongue can also be used to tear somebody down, too. So this is one of the things that, that I think has been laid upon my heart this morning to speak about. And then also mention a few verses that kind of go along with this. One being in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6. Let our speech be always with grace. Things that we say. We should converse about the work of God's grace. But we should also pray for one another. We should also build one another up. We should always look to things of grace. Things that are acceptable to the Lord. And anything said to one another should be said out of love and not anger or ill-mannered. We don't always have to be talking. God gives us a mouth for a reason to communicate. But sometimes silence is golden. And sometimes silence, we need to listen. Stop and listen to that still small voice. I used to tell 
people that I was training previously, if you're talking, you're not listening. If you're, listen, if you're not listening, you're not learning. There's a lot to be said with this. And I think that also goes in, in with God's Word. Not only with, with our studies, but then also how we communicate with one another. With those who are not of primitive Baptist faith. And how we believe. I know there's conversations that I've had that I've had to um, bridle that tongue. And it, it's been, it, sometimes it's very difficult. But 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20, 27, Paul tells us, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. The old Baptists are some of the most loving people out there. And that's one of the things that I love about this church and one of the things I love about its people. Unfortunately, not everybody is like that. There are some who are, who are not uh, kind or have that brotherly love that we should have. We want to see this church and any of the churches grow. One of the things that we should show is love. Extend that hand of fellowship. And with that, and also bridling our tongue, some of the things that we say. Again, these are some of the things that, that I've had to struggle with myself. And I think with age comes wisdom. And I, I think you brethren who are much older than I, and for that guidance, because it is there. We learn, and we learn to have peace. I hope and pray that God uses what's been laid on my heart to edify you. And I pray that God will be with us for the remainder of this service. I appreciate Brother Todd's message concerning bridling our tongue. The Lord, how the Lord exercises his bridle for us is sometimes extraordinary. I understand I am not much on riding horses and very little experience with my life, but I have, do have a little have understanding. I understand that that bit sometimes will pinch and cause pain. And the Lord has the ability to control you with a little pain in your life, to guide you. He has the capacity to direct your steps with loving leadership as a good shepherd, in John chapter 10, but he can also inflict pain. And there are those who don't think that he would do that, but the Bible is replete with the occasions where God did indeed inflict pain to guys. A good message. Appreciate that. Go to open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. The Lord be pleased, like to speak to you a little while concerning the comfort of the Scriptures. The comfort of the Scriptures. I'd like to read with you first verse number 4. Romans chapter 15 and verse number 4. Here the apostle says, For whatsoever things were written afore were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot in that passage, but we have to keep it in its context. There are certain key things that are brought out in our reading this morning, we'll go back and begin with verse number one, that has to do with how we are comforted in how we have patience. Patience and comfort are key words. In this context, patience Excuse me, I have to keep my phone so it will vibrate because my mom 
is very elderly. She lives by herself, and I have trained my mom that if she uh, she gets a bad need to call me, and if she call me one time and I don't answer, call me again, and I don't answer, call me the third time. I don't care what I'm doing. I'm going to answer my, my talk to my mommy. Okay. And y- y- I hope y'all understand that. So uh, there's been a few times when I've given the phone to Sarah and said call back. But um, so if you see me check my phone, that's what it's all about. I'm not I'm not playing uh, video games on my phone during the preaching. Okay. Okay. Back to our subject in verse number four, Romans chapter fifteen, verse number four. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through Patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. Now, the grammar might lead you to think that he's talking, uh, saying that the that the scripture itself exercises patience and is comforted. But in the greater context, what he's saying is that through the scripture we learn patience and we learn to be comforted. Now, in the context of this chapter, it involves each other in how, much like what Brother Todd was talking about, how we help each other with our patience and our comfort. The word patience um, actually has, out of the Bible, has a stronger meaning than the way we use it. The way we normally use the word patient is, you know, you just wait. You just be patient. I always hated that word as a child. Just be patient, son. Just be patient. You know, and it, all creatures have a problem with patience. Even our little Pomeranian puppies have a problem with patience. At night, um, you know, I, uh, we have our, our late night snack, and our little puppies like to have a snack too. And so they like to have the leftovers when we're finished with our snack. And Izzy, the little boy Pomeranian, he will get right in your face and look at you and sneeze. And you tell him, just wait. And he'll slink down. About 30 seconds seconds later, he's back again in your face, sneezing. Meaning, my patience is running out. We are like that too. So that's one meaning of the word patience. But... The word that's translated patience here has the connotation of endurance. That means suffering a lot while we wait. It has a connotation of keeping our focus upon the cause of our life. No matter what's happening around us, keep our focus upon Jesus Christ and His Word. Sometimes it's difficult. When you're in a stressful situation, you must keep your eyes focused on what's real, what you're dealing with. Life sometimes is filled with troubles and trials and heartbreaks and sadness. It's imperative that we be patient. That is, keep our focus upon what is real and what is stable and what is strong and what is enduring. That is Jesus Christ and his word. Now, there's actually another sense of the word patience. And that is enduring the tribulations and the trials while we're waiting upon a positive outcome. Waiting on something good to happen. When I was a kid, we had a little farm. And and there was always something that had to be hoed. I despise, even this day, the sight of a hoe. I swore when I left home that I would never let my hands touch a hoe handle again. I violated that commitment. But but we would hoe tomatoes and beans and peas and potatoes and corn and cane and all that stuff. We hoed it to get all the weeds out. I mean all the weeds had to come out. But Dad would tell us, okay, boys, when you, when you get this patch hoed, you can go down to the lake and you can go swimming. And let me tell you something, we would get after it. We would endure the anguish, the aggravation of it, the hatred for it, 
we would endure that as we waited upon a good outcome. Sometimes life is like that. We have to endure absolutely heartbreaking and distressful things as we wait upon a good outcome. And the good outcome is one. I like to come to church. That's a good outcome for me. When the God blesses, I love to preach the Lord's gospel. That's a good outcome for me. But there's a better outcome. Paul said it this way. To die is gain. To go to me with the Lord is far better. Far better than anything. That's a good outcome. Bob, Paul said to live is Christ. To live through this life. Paul talked about his tribulations, his stonings, his beatings. He was in perils among his brethren, in perils in the waters, in, in, in perils among the, even his own brethren in the sea. He was in peril everywhere. But he said to live is Christ. He says, I'm just enduring all of these hardships for the cause of my Christ. Then he says to die is gain. He says there's something ahead of me that is better. He wasn't doing that to earn the better life in heaven. He was doing it because it had been provided to him by Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That was a good outcome that he was looking forward to. He was patient. He was enduring all the troubles and the trials. You can summarize it this way. The word patience, as it comes to us out of the out of the biblical language, means to persevere. It doesn't mean to persevere in righteousness so we can get to heaven. What it means is to endure whatever this life throws at me, looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Standing up straight and smiling, no matter what the trial is, what the trouble, what the heartbreak is, just standing up straight and pressing on toward the mark of the prize, the high calling. The word comfort, the word comfort has to do with how we feel in this life. Right in the middle of trouble and trial, how do we feel in the midst of our troubles? The scripture teaches us comfort in the middle of our trial. What does comfort mean? Well, the world is falling around, apart around me, but I am at ease because I know that my Lord is on his throne. I feel secure because my Lord has his arms about me. I have a sense of well-being because I'm not alone, but I'm in the care of the Lord my God. I am comfortable because I'm anticipating something better than what I have now. My mind keeps going back to this, so I'm going to go get it. I used this during Sister Diane's funeral. Sister Diane loved the passage, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I, that means I can endure, I can be patient, I can be comfortable, no matter what the trial is before me, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can serve Him. I can keep going. I can keep my focus upon Him. Right on down to just the hours before the Lord took her. When I began to quote that passage in her ear, I said, I can. She turned and looked at me and began to move her lips. She couldn't speak, but she was mouthing, do all things through Christ which strengthen me. That means I can make it through this as well. She had peace. She had, she had um, uh, endurance. She had comfort even in her dying hour. I can, that to me said, I can die too. And I can take my death because my Lord will give me the strength to make it through this too. That's the kind of God that we worship. Now, go back to the first verse with me. He starts off this way. What's our part in this? Brother Todd mentioned the love of our little church family. And truly, you are a lovely group of people. 
lovely in that you're lovely to behold, but you're lovely in that you're loving one toward another. Here he says, we then that are strong. And he's talking about, you know, some people are stronger than others. You know, through the years, of, in my years in the military, I'd go to the gym when I had the opportunity. I would go to the gym and, and I, would, I would get on those exercise machines and I'd go out and I'd run five, six, seven miles a day. I would do all of that. I did it for years. About 40 years, I ran five to seven miles every day. Then I'd go to the gym, and I'd get on those weights, and I would, I'd, I'd work out a little bit before I went back to the office. But there'd be some guys over there that would make me look like a wimp. I mean, they could pick up weights that I, I couldn't even get off the ground, and they could put it over their head. I mean, they were strong. And so I would try to increase my weight sometimes. I'd be laying on the bench and try to reach and get the weight over me. And I'd be struggling and straining, doing all I could. And one of those great big old guys, he'd come over and say, let me help you. And I was just like picking up a stick of butter to him, just easing it up, you know, and easing it back. And it helped me do it two or three times to make me feel good, you know. He was stronger than me. We, some of us, are stronger than the others. Some of us are stronger intellectually. Some of us are stronger in a bodily way. Some of us are stronger in the exercise of our faith. We are a church family, and when we see one another in need, we are to rush to their help, to their aid and help them in any way that we can. To comfort them and to encourage them in biblical patience. Now, what's what Paul says about that? He says, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. The word ought is there for a special reason. The word ought doesn't mean simply that you should. That's the way we normally use it. The word ought that it comes to us in English comes from a word that means you owe it. You owe it to the Lord and to each other. Let me show you just a few of the uses of the word ought. Now, most of you are primitive Baptists know that we just got to go to John chapter 13, right? So let's go there. Let's go there. Remember, it means to be indebted to. I want, you to, I want to show you how the Lord Jesus Christ himself used that word. John chapter 13, we'll find it in verse number 14. We'll read down to it. Now, let me set the scene here, okay? When you study the Scripture, you need to study it in its context. Find out what's going on. Find out who's speaking. Find out who's being spoken to. The context of it. The scene here is that Jesus Christ had just gathered with His apostles in the upper room in the city... They had just eaten the last valid Passover. He had just administered the first communion supper. And when supper was ended, he removed his outer garments. He took a, a basin and he poured water in it. Now, the scene actually began earlier than that when he told two of his disciples to go into the city when they saw a man bearing a pitcher of water to follow him. Now, for us, I carried water all the time as a boy. There were I, many times I had to carry water in an old bucket to water the animals, and I would just make trip after trip. I carried the water. But you know, in the biblical times, the women carried the water. And so in today's world, if you walk up and say, just follow the man that's carrying the pail of water. Which man? But in those days, it was an unusual thing for a man to be carrying water. Why is he carrying water up to where you're going to have the, light, the Passover supper? Why carry water up there? What's so unusual about that? You would think they'd be carrying wine up there because that's what they drink. That's what's on the table of the Passover table. He says, you follow that man who's carrying the water. And so they carried the water up there. Then later on, we find out what that water's for. The Lord removed his outer garment. Now, think about who he is. This man is a man 
but he's also the Son of God and verily God. I want to hear a better amen to that. That man, Jesus Christ, is God. You know why I say that he is? Because he rose from the grave bodily, and his body ascended into heaven, Acts chapter 1. And now he's seated on the right hand of the throne of God, where he reigns as King of kings, and the Lord of lords, and the only potentate. Okay? That's who he is. And so this man, king, high priest, in the upper room, when the supper was ended, he put water into the basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. That was not the traditional thing that was done because this was late in the evening. He knelt down before his brethren and washed their feet. That was the duty of a servant. He's saying to them, yes, I am the Son of God, but I am kneeling before you to wash your feet as a servant would. Then, <clears throat> Peter, watching all of this, Peter seeing this as the Lord moved from one disciple to the next disciples, washing his feet, their feet. And Peter said, Lord, you're just not going to wash my feet. The Lord says, if I wash thee not, you have no part with me. That means in the church kingdom. He says, you need to do this because there's a lesson in it that you need to learn. Well, finally Peter submitted and he washed his feet. Then in verse number 13, when the Lord was finished, he says, <clears throat> verse number 12, get that first. He says, Know ye what I have done to you. Do you know what this means? What picture does this paint to you? What does it mean to you this morning? He says, ye call me Master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. I am your Master, and I am your Lord. Then he says, if I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, then you also, what is that next word? Ought. That means you owe it. You owe it. You also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, the patience and the comfort of the Scriptures. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done unto you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. Now, what he's teaching them is this. You really think you're somebody, don't you? You really think you're somebody. Do you know we all have some of that? Every one of us has got some of that in us. We have a, a spirit of exaltation within us where we exalt ourselves. But the Lord says, that is not going to be in my house. In my house, there's no big eyes and little U's. If I, the Son of God, your Lord and Master, if I can humble my step to wash your feet, then you also ought to wash one another's feet. Now, why do we do that? Well, why do we take communion? One good answer to that is because the Lord said to do it. That's number one. Number two, there's a message behind it. Every time we come to the communion table, we talk about that message. The message of the bread, the message of the wine, and the message of the washing of the saints' feet. We do that because it brings back to memory what Jesus Christ has done for us. When we wash one another's feet as we ought, it reminds us that my brother and my sister is, I, I'm here to serve you. I, I, not only right now, as I'm washing your feet, but next week, the week after, I am here to serve you. I put you on a greater pedestal than myself. I love you. 
And I'm here to serve you and to help you. And through the course of the weeks, we can remember that we are to be forever at our brother and our sister's feet. The Bible doesn't leave us a lot of symbology, but it does leave us that. Because it reminds us, you better be at your brother and your sister's feet to serve them, to help them, to encourage them, and to lift them up in their times of trouble. Now, also, Acts chapter 20, turn there with me. Well, by the way, there's a point that I always like to bring to our attention when we speak of that. The next day, actually, that night, every one of those men that he washed their feet, every one of them forsook him, and Peter denied that he knew him. But he, and he knew that they were going to do it. He told them that they would, and he still lovingly washed their feet. If somebody is one of the members of the church, and sometimes you love, if they offend you, you know what we tend to do? We hold a grudge forever and ever. Do you know that? Anybody good at holding grudges? You don't have to raise your hand. If you're a human being, you are. But we, have, we are compelled by the comfort and the patience of the Scripture to put it aside and to forgive one another. There's even been times I have not done it to my shame. But there's been times when I, I felt in my heart that I ought to just go to a brother and say, let me just wash your feet right down. Let me, let me give you this illustration to show that I love you. And that there's no hard feelings between you and me. Let me give you another one. This is in Acts chapter 20, in verse number 35. The Apostle Paul told about ought, the things we're indebted to do, things we owe. And this is on the same level. The Apostle Paul was on the way uh, to Jerusalem where he would be taken into uh, custody. And he would remain in custody and be taken to Rome. And there he would be slain according to history. And then, but although he knew where he was going, he knew what was going to happen to him. But he stopped at Ephesus to exhort and to encourage the brethren. In verse number 35, while he's talking to these elders, he said unto them, I have shewed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. How about that? Did you always wonder where that passage is? Well, there it is. And what Paul is saying, you're indebted to do it. The weak, those who are weakened by the stresses. You, you know, even the strongest person around can be weakened by tribulation and trial and heartbreak. Brother Todd used the illustration of a 2,000 pound animal. You put that bit in that animal's mouth, and that animal essentially becomes weak or subject to your power over that animal. There are troubles in this life that can weaken us to the point that we need somebody. We need our brethren, we need our sisters to rush to our aid and comfort us and say those beautiful words, I love you and I'm here to help you to the best of my ability. We ought to support the weak. 1 John 3 and 16, let's look at another one. 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 16. Now, this is one of the areas of Scripture where we can stay here all day, but we won't do that. 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 16. John says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. Are you reading with me? If you're not reading, write it down. Hereby we perceive the love of God. That means I can feel God's love for me. Can you feel it this morning? Can you feel the love of a God? God the Father that sent His only begotten and beloved Son of His world to die for you. Can you feel the love of the Son of God? That great love wherewith He loved us as He gave His life. 
bearing your sins away from you and securing your home in heaven. Can you feel that love this morning? He says, Hereby perceive we the love of God because He laid down His life for us. What a wonderful thing. A magnanimous thing. So great that I can't find uh, uh, enough adjective to describe it. He loved me. He died for me. He bore my sins away from me. He washed me white as snow, white as wool. He secured my home in heaven. And one blessed and holy day, like Job said in Job 19, I'll see him for myself. I will look upon him with my own eyes because of what he's done for me. Is that good news? He says, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That means whatever I have to sacrifice, no matter how great the sacrifice, your needs are greater than mine. Whatever I can do, no matter what it costs me, I want to help you. I want to rush to your aid. I want to show you that I love you. I want to pick you up when you're cast down. I want to put my arms around you when your heart is broken. One more. First John chapter 4. Verse number 11. Beloved, 1 John 4 and 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, that word so means if God loved us with such a great love, such a mighty love, such an eternal love. Do you know that love is so great that Paul said that there's nothing wrong with separate that can separate us from the love of God? What a blessing. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. He loved us. How much did He love us? You ever wonder about that? How much did God in heaven love us? Turn back to Romans chapter 5 with me just a minute. Romans chapter 5. Just so loved us. God so loved us. If He loved us so much. So what are we to do with that love? If he loved, just how much did He love us? What state were we in when God the Father loved us? And came into this world. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 7. Where Paul says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for adventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God committed his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were still in the state of sin, practicing sin, living sin, thinking sin, behaving sinfully, and yet Jesus Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were still in a state of sin, and when we were enemies, that means we were fighting against Jesus, His Word, His church. If or if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. That means he sent his son in this world uh, to pay your sin debt, to reconcile your righteousness and your holiness and your justification before God the Father. This morning, by the grace and mercy of God, you stand before the Lord God Almighty as righteous, as just, as holy, as godly, fit for heaven because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Much more being uh, reconciled, ye shall be saved by his life. Verse number 11, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the, inter uh, the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin into the world, and death by sin, one man brought sin. But let me tell you something, one man brought life, one that blind, uh, man brought justification, one man brought holiness, one man brought godliness, and that was Jesus Christ. And when you were yet in your sins, and you were yet enemies against Him, He did it for you. You. Now, back to Romans chapter 15. We then that are, are strong ought to bear the infirmities of, weak, of the weak. That means as you're looking around and you sense that one of your, uh, your, your, your by the way, there's another subject about uh, related to this. You remember when the Pharisee asked the Lord, who then is my neighbor? I believe it's in Luke chapter 10. We're not going to go there for the second time. But when, when the Pharisee asked him, who then is my neighbor? You remember what the illustration the Lord gave me? He says, there was a man who was a Samaritan. 
There was a man who was a priest, and there was a man who was a Levite. And there was a guy, there was a guy who was on the road, and the marauders attacked him, robbed him, and left him for naked, and left him for dead. The Levite passed by, uh, the, the priest passed by, but this Samaritan passed by and saw him in his condition and put him on his animal and took him to the inn and paid for his care and told the innkeeper, when I come back, if he owes more, I'll pay that too. Then the Lord says, who was his neighbor? And the lawyer, it was the lawyer that asked the question, and the lawyer had to say, the Samaritans, those people that we don't like, you know, they're not quite as good as we are. They're not as righteous and holy as we are. He had to admit, admit that the priest and the Levite were not neighborly, but the Samaritan was. That's one of those cases that I'd like to be like the Samaritan, wouldn't you? When you're passing by, uh, when you learn of the need of one of your church members, when somebody's about to have surgery... Pray for them, surely, but go to their aid and lift them up and help them and comfort them. When somebody's lost someone that they love, rush to them and love them and encourage them and help them. When somebody's disadvantaged uh, in some way, they need something and you can provide it, go to them and provide it for them and help them and lift them up and provide for them in every way. Then in verse number two, he says, Let every one of us please his neighbor... For it is good to edification. Please his neighbor. That's not, remember the word please. That means make your neighbor happy. If you can say something to make your neighbor happy, say it. If you can do something for them to make them happy. I'm sorry, Brother James, but I guess use one more illustration. When Sister Diane was in one of her more troubled times, I happened to have the idea that she just might like a milkshake. I couldn't fix her problems. I couldn't heal her. But if I could do a little something to ease her suffering for a little time, I wanted to do it. We can all, that's a small thing. We can all do that for each other. We can rush to each other's aid. And so, what can I do to lift you up for just a little season? What can I do to shine a little light in the darkness of your life? How can I encourage you? How can I come to you? Jesus let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification, to build them up, to help them stand up and be strong. And then verse number three, even for even Christ, listen now, for even Christ pleased not himself. He came not into this world to do his own will in his words. I came not to do my own will. But what did you come for, Jesus? I came to do the will of him that has sent me. John chapter 6. And this is the will of my Father which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. Jesus Christ came not to, uh, not to, uh, to, to be, to serve, uh, I mean to be served, but he came in this world to serve. Did you know he came in this world to serve you by obtaining for you eternal life? He came in this world to serve his Father, to obtain for you eternal life by the death of himself. You know, they were looking for a man to come after David uh, that would come into town riding at the head of a great army. Uh, uh, riding up in a chariot of gold, uh, stripped with, uh, uh, established with power and glory, great armies following him. 
They were looking for him to set up a throne in Jerusalem with all the pomp and all the majesty and glory. Yet this man came riding into town humbly. He was set riding upon an ass and a cold and fold of an ass and they laid palms before him, laid their clothes before him and called him uh, and said to them, uh, Hallelujah, this is the one that we're looking for. He was a man that had no place to lay his head. He was a man that came in, uh, into the world at the most humble beginnings and he ended his life hanging on the cross, dying for you and for me. But when he was asked, are you a king? He says, thou sayest, it was your words. I am the king. And so, it was ordered that, that the words would be put over his throne. King. He was the king, my friends. He was your king. He is your king today. He's your king of kings. He's your Lord of lords. He's the only potentate. He came of this world as your high priest, Jesus Christ, hanging on the cross. He came in this world to do a certain thing. He had three offices on that cross. You know that? He was the king. Amen? He was the king. He was the one in charge. You know they couldn't have taken his life? They didn't take his life. He gave his life. He had the power to lay it down. He had the power to take it up. And he did three days later. He was the king. He still reigns as king today. Not only was he the king, he was the high priest. He came into this world uh, to minister, to serve, to sacrifice himself. That your high priest sacrificed himself to pay your sin debt. He is your high priest. The third office that he had on the cross was he was a sacrifice. He was the king, he was the priest, and he was the sacrifice. He offered himself for you on the cross. And when all was done, he said, it is finished. Father, I've paid their sin debt. I've washed them white as snow. I, I've prepared them for glory, Father. And because that is so true, when your dying hour is, or comes, uh, you can look toward heaven by the grace of God. And you can, you can uh, I trust that we'll all be able to see as Stephen saw, uh, the, the Lamb of God standing on the right hand of the throne of God to see Him all in all of His glory. We can see it and behold Him and rejoice in Him. And then when He reaches down to take us to that blessed place, my friends, where we behold beauty and majesty and glory so great that Paul couldn't even describe it. And then one blessed and holy day, when these bodies are raised to life again, and he puts that soul in this body, we'll be carried to heaven, soul, our body, and spirit, where we'll forever be with the Lord. What a blessed thought. Has Jesus Christ done anything for you? Notice what he says, Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. That's taken from uh, Psalm 69 and verse number 9. You go read it on your own time. This is my time. This is the Lord's time. Now listen to what he said. He says, the reproaches of them that reproached thee. To reproach means to, they fought against God. They argued against God. They disobeyed God. They uh, sought their own will and their own glory over that of God. They reproached God. Listen to what he says. The reproaches of them that reproached thee. They reproached them. All of those things that happened that were done, the sins of the people, fell on me. That means all the sins of all the children of God, they fell on me. It ought to be clear. Why the Lord, on the night before he was crucified in the garden, he prayed, Lord, if it could be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Surely he didn't want to be crucified in the international sense. But let me tell you something. He could see that moment hanging there between the heavens and the earth when the whole earth was dark and he knew it was going to be dark, by the way. When he was made to be sin, he bore your sins away in his person. He took it away from you. He could see it and know it was coming. So he says, Father, if it could be thy will, let this cup pass from me. But then he said, I'm a servant in this sense, but not my will, but thine be done. I will do it, Father, because you sent me to do it. 
So I'm bearing the reproaches of them that have reproached thee. They've fallen on me. That means I'm taking them. I'm going to bear them away. And that's what he did for your sin, your reproaches. He took them away from you as the scapegoat. He took them so far away that they'll never, ever be returned to you. Now, he says in verse number four, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, including the New Testament, notice that uh, the things are in plural. Talking about Psalm 69, but everything that's written about Jesus Christ and the whole word is about Him, right? So he says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. We ought to learn. The more we learn, the happier we are. The more we learn, the more patience we have. The more we learn, the more comfort we have in this life. The, mo the more we learn about the Word of God, the more we encourage and we read things like, like when, when, when Moses uh, was being called to go down to Egypt, he had all these arguments. Lord, don't do that. I, I can't do that. I can't talk. I'm afraid they won't listen to me. He had all these arguments. And he finally got down to the bottom line, Lord, just didn't anybody but me. But what happened? The Lord says, they'll listen to me. And probably Moses said, well, who am I going to tell us that? And he said, you tell her I am sent you. And when they got down there, they knew who I am was because I am was already there on the scene. The point is, we take great comfort. God can help you do impossible things. He can strengthen you against impossible odds. He can lift you up when you think that all is lost and you think, I'll never have peace, I'll never have joy, I'll never have happiness again. God can lift you up and comfort you and give you strength. And then one day you look back and you say, my goodness, that was an awful storm that I went through. And I made it. Because God said, peace be still. That's how I made it. For whatsoever things were written before time were written for our learning, that through patience and comfort of the Scripture we might have hope. Now the God of patience and consolation. That means God is the ultimate one that brings uh, the, uh, our patience and our consolation. That word consolation, by the way, just a piece of information for you, is exactly the same word that's uh, translated comfort. That means, but the English word comes to us to add just a slight different meaning to us in the English. That means when we need consoling, when we're in distress, and we need, we, we, we need some help, we need some to lift up. He says, your God is the one that does that. Now, surely God can do it, just, and he does do it, just right by himself. But you know, sometimes he uses us. He puts an impression on our heart. He says, call brother, call sister, some, uh, uh, and, and you say, well, what am I going to say when I call him? You know, sometimes there were times the Lord told his disciples, don't worry about what you're going to say. I'll give you what you say when you get there. Sometimes we like that. We call and we encourage. You know, sometimes some of the best encouragement to me is, I love you. <laughs> I love you. You're my brother. I love you. And to hear those words, I don't know about you, but that will flat pick me up in a minute. I wonder why anybody, especially the Lord, would love me. But when somebody tells me that, it means a lot to me. It lifts me up. That means I'm standing by you. I'm right there with you. I'm going to be with you. He says, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one uh, toward another according to Jesus Christ. That means think for a while what Jesus Christ has done for you. Think for how he suffered for you. He says, you think about it. And the way Jesus Christ helped you, comforted you, died for you when you were yet in your sins, you remember that when you're taking care of each other, calling them, going to see and helping them. All right? Verse number six. He says, that ye may with one mind and one mouth. That means, that means we all say the same things. We're all talking about the same things. We're all talking about the same Word of God. We're all together in the understanding that Jesus Christ is our Savior. And the Holy Spirit is the Comforter. Even the Lord, our, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The last verse, verse number 7. He says, Wherefore receive ye one another. How did, how did Jesus Christ receive you? What kind of condition were you in when He received you? 
Who we just said, Romans chapter 5. He received you when you were his enemy. He received you when you were yet in sin. He received you when you were rebelling against him. He says, wherefore receive you one another as Christ also received us to the glory of God. And so we receive one another, we rush to one another's aid, we encourage one another, we lift up one another. And in doing so, Jesus Christ tells us, in John chapter 13, after he had washed the disciples' feet, uh, Jesus Christ tells us, By this all men know that you are my disciples, if what? You have love one to another. You ought to be known as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Show love one to another. May God bless you, my prayer.